How y'all doing, good people? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing. Share the video. Smash that like button for me. I really would appreciate it. Also, hit that post notification bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. Be careful down in the comment section of the videos. A lot of spam, a lot of scammers. I will never ask you to contact me by WhatsApp or Telegram. I also do not invest money for my subscribers. So please be careful. Don't get yourself scammed. If you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo Moo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks when you open a new Moomoo Moo brokerage account. They're going to give you up to 15 free stocks for just trying out their brokerage app. When you put $100 in that brokerage app, they're going to give you five free stocks. When you put $1,000 in your Moomoo Moo brokerage app, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. Now, guys, this is a limited time offer, so don't delay. Act today. There's a link down in the description box of this video. Go click on that Moomoo Moo link. Open up your new Moomoo Moo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. You guys know I'm rocking with Moomoo Moo for 2024 and beyond to buy my big boy blue chip three paper assets through my wealth transfer blueprint. Guys, this morning, before I jumped on this live stream, before this video, I went and purchased two of my big boy blue chip paper assets. I'm starting to accumulate every single day, guys. I'm buying every single day. Now, my blueprint calls for once a month investing through dollar cost averaging. That's what the blueprint calls for. But I'm starting to see a trend. What's going on right now, which I'm going to unpack for you this morning. What's going on in our financial market? What's going on in the economy? What's going on with jobs? What's going on with stocks? What's going on with crypto real estate? We're going to talk about that today. Based on that information, I'm buying, guys. Every single day, I'm buying, right? So all I'm telling you is if you want to build wealth, there is no greater opportunity than right now. No greater opportunity. So position yourself. Get yourself in a position where you can buy some assets and buy them now. That's my opinion. I'm not your financial advisor. I can't tell you what to do. All I can do is provide what I'm doing. And there's a reason I'm buying every day, guys. I can see it. I'm not a fortune teller. I don't have a crystal ball, but I can see what's coming. I can see what's coming. So I'm preparing myself. I am ready. Now, you can do whatever you want to do. You want to buy the dip? You want to wait on the sideline and try to guess in time? Go right ahead. Try your luck at that. History tells us it's not very good strategy. It's not a very good strategy to try to be an expert. It's not a very good strategy to try to time the market, guys. It's not. <laughs> the best way to build wealth that I know of is just to be in the market 365 days a year. Why? Because I never know when I'm going to get on that rocket ship. I never know when the rocket ship is going to take off. I never know when the rocket ship's going to take off. I just need to be on the rocket, buckled in, ready to go at all times. And that's why I'm in the market every single day. 365 days a year for the next 10 years. I'm going to be in the market every single day. It's because that's what investors do. See, that's what investors do. 
So if you want to be an investor and not a consumer, if you want to be an investor, not a consumer, big difference. You guys who've been rocking with me, you know there's a big difference. There's a big difference between consumer, investor. For you folks that are brand spanking new, you may not know the difference, but there's a difference. I'm not a consumer. I'm an investor. What's the difference, Richard? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Let me quickly tell you the difference before I unpack today's topics. The difference between a consumer and an investor. As a consumer, number one, I'm in the matrix. I'm in the matrix. I'm in an alternate state of mind, right? I'm, in, I don't live, I'm not in a real world state of mind. I'm in an alternate state of mind in the matrix. And what does the matrix want me to do? The matrix wants me to work every day, earn money, and do what with that money? Spend it on things that I don't need. Spend it on things that make the 1% wealthy. That the matrix wants me to create what? Liabilities and debt. That's the matrix. That's being a consumer where I'm going out, working my tail off every single day, but I got nothing to show for it other than a bunch of things that are worthless, right? See, see, the matrix want you to believe the things that you own are assets, but in actuality, they're liabilities. See, that's the matrix. That's a consumer. High interest rate credit card debt, high interest rate loan debt, right? Thinking our home that we live in is an asset when in actuality, it's a dead asset. It doesn't create any income. We want to pour 30, 40 percent of our money into some house that produces no income. That's the matrix. Over here as an investor, what do I do? I work my tail off. But what do I do with that money? What do I do with that money? I invested in assets that do what? Build wealth. So that's what consumer investor. I'm an investor. I'm in the market every day. I'm building wealth every single day. Just bought SPLG this morning. Just bought some more FT, FTEC this morning. Killing it, guys. Killing it. In the green, in the green, in the green. Now, they're going to be red days. Don't let that bother me. What do I do on red days, guys, who've been rocking with me? What do we do on red days? If you've been rocking with me, and you're part of this wealth transfer blueprint. You've adapted that philosophy of building wealth. What do we do on the red days? If we believe in this, there we go. I know my guys would pop in here at some point and help it they boy out. We buy more. That's what we do on red days. See, that's what we do as investors on red days when we're trying to build wealth to get to our pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Red days don't scare us. Red days are opportunity, baby. Red days are opportunities to accelerate your wealth. So you should be welcoming red days. You should be welcoming red days. We just buy more, right? That's the point I'm trying to get you guys to understand in this wealth building blueprint, this wealth transfer blueprint. We got to be in the market every single day. I don't care if you buy $5 worth. I don't care if you buy $100 worth. Get in the market. Get yourself activated. Stop being deactivated over here as a consumer right in the matrix. You're deactivated. Get your butt over here as an investor and activate yourself. Activate your freedom. That's what we got to do, guys. So this morning, guess what? I put my money where my mouth was. I went ahead and pulled the trigger on some of my two, two of my three big boy blue chip investments, paper assets. Just pulled the trigger on some more. And guess what? On Monday, back at it again. Right. I'm going to buy as much as I can afford to buy, guys, because I know what's coming. I know what's coming. And we're going to talk about what's coming right now. But before we do that, let me walk you guys through some of these things that I want to make sure you understand before we get out of here. 
Fed. Let's start with the Fed. We got four things we want to cover. We want to cover the Fed. We want to cover the jobs report that just came out this morning. Very critical information, guys. We're going to tie this thing all together in a nice, real nice bow that looks real good. We're going to tie it together. We're going to talk about stocks. And we're going to talk about that daily dose of crypto. We're going to talk about the real estate. We're going to talk about that in item number one, the real estate market. And, and, and why I believe, hmm, hmm. We're going to talk about it, though. We're going to talk about it. So those are the four items we're going to cover in today's video. Fed, jobs, stocks, and your daily dose of crypto. Those are the things we're going to cover. So let's start with the Fed. If you guys have been watching this week, you know I've been telling you guys that the Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell, went on Capitol Hill. He went to Washington, D.C., and he met with the House, and he also met with the Senate. Now, those two bodies make up what we call Congress, right? You got the House of Representatives, and then you got the Senate. Both of them had their opportunity to talk to Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. The House did it on Wednesday, and on Wednesday when the House had him, this is what he had to basically say. Economy's doing okay. Jobs are doing okay. Inflation, we see progress. That's basically what he said. And when you wrap all of that up, what, what was, you know, what really was the chairman telling the House of Representatives? He was basically telling them, look guys, we're doing our job. Our job 24 months ago, two years ago, was to radically reduce inflation. And guess what, guys? That's what we did. We used one of our number one tools to fight inflation. And guess what that number one tool is? Somebody in the chat tell me what that number one tool the Fed uses to fight inflation. Help me out, guys. I know I got some of my folks in here that rock with me. They know exactly what that is. What's that number one tool, guys? There you go. I know one of my guys would step up. Number one tool the Fed uses to fight inflation is interest rates, guys. And guess what? They've been on them interest rates for 24 months, and they've made a lot of progress. And basically, that's what the Fed chair told the House Finance Committee, right? The Finance Service committee in the House of Representatives. That's what he told them yesterday, uh, on Wednesday. He said, guys, we got it under control. We got it under control. Now, of course, they wanted to know when you're going to reduce interest rates, if you got it under control. If you got it so much under control, when do we see interest rates come down? That's what they wanted to know on Wednesday in the House. And of course, you know, the chairman, he basically said, you know, he's a diplomatic guy. He's a smart guy. You know, he knows his stuff. He knows how to handle a room. He knows how to handle a crowd of, of, of members of the House of Representatives. And he basically told him, hold your horses, guys. It's coming. It's coming. Don't worry about it. We got your back. We got your back. We got your back. It's coming. But not just yet. Not just yet. We're still not 100% satisfied that inflation is not going to reverse itself and try to double back on us. We got to make sure that before we reduce those rates. But guess what? We got your back. We plan on doing it sometime this year, though. And that's basically what the Fed chair told them. We've done our job, guys. Our job was to get inflation down from its high water mark in June of 2022 when it was 9%. That was our job. And over the last 24 months, we've done our job. We're not done yet, though. We're close. And until we are absolutely 100% sure that inflation won't reverse itself, we're going to keep rates higher for longer. But... We are planning on reducing them sometime this year. Now, that's what he told those folks over at the House of Representatives in the Financial Services Committee. That's what he told them on Wednesday. Now, on Thursday, he went over to the Senate and met with the Senate 
banking committee. And in that meeting, it was a little bit different because one of the questions that were asked in that meeting is, well, Chair Powell, what are you guys going to do about this $1 trillion in commercial real estate loans that are coming due in 2024? How do you see that affect in the economy? That was a harder question for him, guys, because that's a problem. That's a problem. That's a problem. That $1 trillion worth of commercial real estate that's going to be maturing or loans going to be, loan rates are going to be resetting is a problem. Why is that a problem? I'm going to tell you here in a second. Let me get a cup of, uh, of my coffee, a, a, a drink of my coffee. I'm going to tell you. Why is that a problem? Because here's the deal, guys. You know we've had these banks that have failed over the last couple of years, right? We had Silicon Valley Bank fail. We had Signature Bank fail. We had First Republic Bank fail. We got a bank up in New York right now that's wobbly. It's on life support. It's wobbly, right? I believe it's called New York Community Bank or something like that, but it's wobbly. That's a problem. That's a problem. One thing a lot of these banks that have failed have in common is that they have a high concentration of commercial real estate loans versus their deposits, non-FDIC insured deposits. So what does that mean, Richard? What, what that means is the customer deposits that they have in their bank, a lot of those deposits for those depositors are over the threshold where the FDIC insurance will insure the deposits. So if you have over $250,000 in a bank, a federally chartered bank, technically you're only insured on $250,000. Anything over that, if that bank fails, technically you're not insured. And that's the problem. A lot of these banks who have this large concentration of CRE loans, that's short for commercial real estate, are small and medium-sized banks. That's a problem. And I've told y'all, if y'all been rocking with me, I've told y'all before, small and medium-sized banks, they make their money off of lending your money. That's their primary source of revenue. Not like the big banks, not like the too big to fail banks. These guys have 80 to 100 ways of making money. I'm talking about the big boy banks, not these small and medium sized banks, guys. Their main source of revenue when it comes from interest income comes from loans. And they take your money that you put in their little bank. They lend that money out. Now, if they make bad loans or if they concentrate too much of your money in one type of loan and that, and, that, and that industry that they concentrated your money in goes sideways a little bit, guess what? That's a problem because when you and I walk in there to ask for our money, they're going to tell us they don't have it. That's the problem. And that's what they were grilling him on yesterday. At least one of the, the senators were grilling uh, Jay Powell on yesterday was, what are you guys going to do? And then this is what Jay Powell basically said. And, and, and guys, you guys can go look at the transcript and go listen to the whole meeting yesterday that he had with the Senate Banking Committee. I'm not telling you something that wasn't there. I, I may paraphrase it, but this is what the guy said. They expect more bank failures. That's what he said. They expect more bank failures. But guess who those banks are going to be? These little small and medium-sized banks. Those are the banks they expect more failures. Why? Because these CRE loans come and do. A lot of those, that one trillion, belong to these small and middle or, 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 or medium-sized banks. Yeah. Bunch of those one trillion. See, he said they're not worried about the too big to fail banks. They're not worried about the Bank of Americas, the J.P. Morgan Chase, the Wells Fargo, the Citibank, the U.S. Bank. They ain't worried about them. 
Why? Because them people ain't got no concentration in CRE. These people got 80 to 100 different ways of making money. They got 80 to 100 different lines of business where they make money in the big boy banks. But these little banks, mm -mm, they got one or two ways they make money, guys. And a, one of those huge ways they make money is taking your deposits and giving them to people through loans. And they are really concentrated when it comes to these CRE loans, guys. Huge concentration. One trillion dollars. That's a big old number, guys. A lot of zeros behind it. So only thing I want you guys to understand, and I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to get you to panic and freak out. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to provide you information so you can make a better financial decision about what you're doing with your money. Because, see, the last thing you want to do is one of them banks fail and you got your money and then you're going to be scratching your head talking about, I didn't know it was, well, I didn't know nothing was even wrong with it. I didn't know. How am I supposed to know? Well, now you know. And again, I'm not saying your little medium size or small bank in your little town that you bank with is going to fail. And a lot of y'all got your money on these online banks. Let me tell you something, guys. <laughs> you better be careful. I know you're chasing this little money market rate. I know you're chasing this little high yield savings account rate, but if you got $250,000 or more in there, you better be careful. You better be careful. You do understand these people, oh, oh they got it, just the goodness of their heart, they're going to give you a 5% money market rate for just no reason. You know if they're giving you a 5% money market rate, you got to understand what they're chasing. See, this is the thing I try to get you guys to understand. If they're giving you 5%, what do you think they're chasing? What do you think they're chasing? Twice, three times, four times what they're paying you? Yeah. Yeah. If they're paying you five, how in the world do they make money? <laughs> they got to be pretty aggressive, guys, is what I'm saying. They got to be pretty aggressive. Do you wonder why the big boy, too big to fail banks don't pay you 5%? But your little mom and pop banks will? Your little online banks that ain't nobody never heard of? You know why they do it? Because that's the only way they make money. See, these big boy banks, they know you got no other choice. See, they, they, they so big, they're not concentrated like that. They so big, they're going to say, you know something? There ain't no reason for us to pay you 5%. We're too big. You got to come to us. And guess what? You're really not their main client anyways. Their main clients over that 80 to 100 lines of business are really wealthy people, companies. That's really their main clients. The general bank where you come into play for most of these folks, they don't really make their money off of you from an interest standpoint. What they really make their money off of you is what they call non-interest income. So all these millions and millions of customers that these big boy banks have, they make their money off non-interest income where they charge you fees. That's where they make their money off of you and the big boy banks. See, you think, oh, they they make it off of all these loans they do to me. Not really. Not really. The consumer bank for these big boy banks, they make their money through the non-interest revenue that they get from you. Overdraft fees, monthly maintenance fees. Uh, they, they get it off uh, check orders that you order from them. Anything that has to do with earning income that doesn't have anything to do with loans that's where they get the bulk of their money off of you guys at the big boy banks. See, at these little banks and these medium-sized banks, they get the bulk of their money off of you through loans, through taking your deposits and lending them out to people in the commercial real estate arena. Problem is, commercial real estate is in trouble. Number one, office is in trouble, especially in the big cities. Pretty much a ghost town in the big cities. When you go into these big cities, you got big old gigantic skyscrapers empty or barely with people in them, half full. Those loans are coming due, guys. You got retail. You know the online push is getting even better, especially with technology. A lot of people are shopping from home. They don't even really have to go. I still go to brick and mortar because I'm just an old dinosaur guy. I like brick and mortar. But a lot of people don't shop brick and mortar no more, guys. So guess what happened? These retailers are starting to do what? Shrink down their brick and mortar footprint. They're starting to shrink down. So what happens is when their lease comes due, 
And this one trillion dollars right here, right? This one trillion dollars in commercial real estate. Let's say these retailers, these big boy, gigantic retailers say, you know something, Richard? Hey, we enjoyed our five year lease with you in your little strip center. But guess what? We're not renewing it. And by the way, that was your anchor. That was your anchor tenant. Yeah, Home Depot says, you know something, Richard? It's been a great 10 year run. We out. We out. That's your anchor. That's where all your revenue is coming from. Yep, you got some little bitty guys next to them, but the anchor is where the revenue comes from. You lose that anchor. You got this 30, 40, 50,000 square foot retail center. They occupy, let's say it's 40,000 square foot retail center. They occupy 30. And they tell you they're not going to renew their lease. But you still got loan outstanding to this little small bank. It's a little medium-sized bank. What you going to do? It ain't that easy to fill that 30,000 square feet, guys. So that's the problem these small and medium-sized banks are going to run into, both in retail and in um, office. Another one they're going to run into is what? Multifamily. See, multifamily is very competitive right now. Why is multifamily very competitive? Because you got Wall Street firms in the real estate business now. You got Wall Street firms in the real estate business now. They are building five, six, seven thousand unit apartment complexes. So your little hundred unit, guess what? They're going to undercut you because they got scale. They're going to undercut you. They're going to undercut your rent in your small 100 unit, uh, 75 unit, 50 unit, 25 unit apartment building. They're going to undercut you. And you're going to start losing some tenants. Because you got to stay at the height of the rent market because you got a big old gigantic loan that got to be paid back. See, these Wall Street guys ain't got no loans. They ain't got no loans. They ain't got no loans. These pay cash. See, they can undercut you and run you out of business. Then they jack up their rents. Once they run you out of business, then they go jack up the rents. But they're going to eliminate the competition first. So all you little mom and pop folks around here with these, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 units, it's going to be tough on you. And guess who did all the loans for those people? Small and medium sized banks. See, this commercial real estate thing is real when it comes to deposits because they use your deposits. How do, who you, ain't got nothing to do with me if the, the commercial real estate market is gonna go to crap. I, that doesn't got anything to do with me. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Where do you think they get the money to lend to? To these people. Where do you think they got it from? Just got it out of the... You know, no, they got it from your deposits. It's your deposits. That's the reason the senator asked him, well, well what, what, what are you guys gonna do? What are you going to do with this one trillion dollars in CRE debt when we know it's small and medium sized banks who hold most of that paper? And we know they've taken customer deposits to lend that money out to these people. What are you going to do if those real estate properties fail? What are you going to do? And, and Jay Powell just basically said, you know, hey, we're in communications with these banks. We've identified the ones we believe are at risk and we have had conversations with them. We're asking them, what is their plan when it comes to these CRE loans? What are your plans? But he also went on to say some banks will fail. Just telling you guys. So that's why I tell y'all it's important for you to pay attention when the Fed is having these meetings. You ain't got to be an expert, guys, because I'm not. I'm no expert. I just listen. And then I listen and, and, and see what the responses are. And this CRE thing. And it was real interesting where he said, this is not, and, and he didn't say this, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying this. I'm throwing my own little, little, little spin on it. Basically what he's saying, this CRE problem, this $1 trillion in CRE real estate is a mainstream problem, not a Wall Street problem. All that means, and, and that's my words, not Jay Powell's words, but my words is, it's a Main Street problem, not a Wall Street problem. 
All that means is it's not a tier one bank problem. It's not a B of A, Wells, JP, none of them guys. It's not a problem on their end. They're very, got, got enough liquidity. They got different lines of business. They're not concentrated just in CRE. It's a Main Street problem, which is basically what? Depositors and small and medium-sized banks. That's Main Street. Wall Street, no problem. Because I keep telling y'all who, who, who control this country, who make all the rules, who, who, who dictate what go on. I keep telling y'all it's the 1%. See, you know, see, but, but you got to listen to these guys and they tell you exactly what's happening, right? He basically saying, no, 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 no. This ain't a Wall Street problem. This is not a one percenter problem. This is a 99 percenter problem. And guess what he said? Some of them going to fail. Some of them are going to fail, guys. I'm just telling you, take a look at what you got going on with your banking situation. Make sure you understand if your bank that you currently bank with is at risk. Perhaps if you go on their website and you go to their investor relationships tab, you can click on investor, relation, investor relations. That's what it's called. Click on that. And there you should be able to see their financial status. Now, if it's a private bank, you probably won't be able to do that. What does private bank mean? That means it's not publicly traded. It's not a publicly traded company. They ain't gonna have to show you nothing. You, may, you, you go on the website, you ain't gonna see no financials. If it's, if, it's, if it's a privately held bank, you ain't gonna see that. Now, if it's publicly traded, it can still be a small or a medium-sized bank and be publicly traded. You should be able to go onto their website, click on investor relations, and you should be able to see their, their, their balance sheet. And what you wanna look for is commercial real estate concentration. You want to see what part of their balance sheet is dedicated towards commercial real estate loans. And if that's a big old gigantic number and everything else is a lot smaller than that, then they're concentrated. That's how you find out. Now, these private banks, who knows? You won't know until they close the doors because they ain't going to tell you. <laughs> Trust me. They're not going to tell you. Well, hey, guys, we're having some problems in the... You know, we don't know. We're going to make it. We just wanted to make you aware. They're not going to tell you that. None of them are going to tell you that. What's going to happen is you're going to go there one day and it's going to be closed. Or you're going to be strolling through social media, looking at your favorite uh, entertainer, your favorite athletes, you know, in their business. And then all of a sudden you're going to see something run across, say, XYZ bank closed. You're going to be like, oh, my God, that's my bank. Oh, shoot. I'm in here in this guy business. I need to be in my own business. I'm worried about this guy's business, this gal's business. I'm laughing and he here and he on because I'm looking at a skit on Facebook and I ain't even worried about my financial life. I'm, I'm more worried about the skit on Facebook. See, that's what we do, though. I keep telling y'all, you better get your financial house in order and figure out where you got your money at. There's a reason they're giving you a 5% interest rate. Why the big boys don't do that? See, this is the question y'all got to ask yourself. Why don't the big boys... The big boys, too big to fail banks, pay you 5% on your money market. Have you ever thought about that? But this little bank over here will. This online bank will. Have you ever thought about why they do that and the big boys don't? I'll tell you why they do it. Because they want to attract your deposits and then they're going to take them deposits and try to get them a 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x return and give you the 1x and they're going to try to 3x, 4x, 5x it. Because it's the only way they make money. See, the big boys don't got to do that. They ain't got to give you 5% because they don't really need your deposits. They'll take them, but they don't need them. Because if they needed them, they'd pay you 5% too, but they don't need them. They're flushed with deposits. You think Bank of America really needs your deposits? They don't. Why do you think when you walk in there, you get the service you get? <laughs> they don't care. They don't care. They're damn near a $2 trillion bank. They don't care anything about you. So they're never going to pay you 5%. But your little online bank, they will. Your little mom and pop bank in your hometown, they might will. Because they have to. That's the only way they attract money. 
See, they'll track your deposits and then they take those, track, those, those deposits and they try to 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x their return off of your deposits. So yes, they'll pay you 3% or 4% on your money market while rates are up, right? It's not gonna be in perpetuity, it's while rates are up. So all I'm telling you is the Fed chair, if you would have just paid attention these two days and listened to what he had to say and listened to the questions from the House and from the Senate, you would have had a better idea of what's going on with this economy. You'd have a better idea of what's going on in the financial markets and you'd have a better idea of which asset is in trouble. Deposits, CRE loans, small, medium-sized banks, you better take a look at it. That's all I'm telling you. I'm not telling you to take your money out of your bank and take it to somewhere else. That's not what I said. All I said is you better figure out what is the financial strength of your little mom and pop bank that you got your money in. You better go find out what your financial strength is of this little online bank that ain't nobody never heard of that you done put your hard-earned money into to get a five chasing a 5% interest rate. You better figure out what they're doing with your money because it's not just sitting there and they're saying, you know something, we're, hey guys, thank you very much. We're not gonna make any money. We're just gonna give you 5%, but we make no money. Y'all know better than that, right? If they're giving you 5%, you know what they're chasing, right? You know what type of returns they're chasing. If they can give you 5%, come on guys, they're chasing 15, 20, 30, 40% returns somewhere doing something with your deposits. Problem is, you don't know what they're doing with them. You haven't stopped and asked. You haven't did any research. You just, you just see a 5% rate and boom, huh, let me wire transfer it to you. And he, before you know it, you're an ACH to some bank online. You ain't, you, no brick and mortar, nobody to talk to other than a computer. Guys, you better stop. I'm telling you, pay attention. Figure out what's going on with these small and in, 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 in medium bank size banks. There's a CRE concentration that a lot of them have. And boy, it's coming to a headwind, I'm telling you. Because the, the, the Fed had already told you, if you paid attention to the meetings, he had already told y'all, rates gonna stay higher for longer. These loans are coming due this year. One trillion dollars worth. Either they're coming due to maturity or their loan, their fixed rate is expiring. They gotta reset the rate. And guess what? They're gonna reset it higher. Plus, if one of those retailers or, or, or an office building tenant decides we want to leave and they represent most of your square footage in your office building or in your retail building or your retail center. Woo. Guys, I was in commercial banking for a lot of years. A lot of years. I was in commercial banking in 2008 when this thing just completely blew up. Whole strip centers were empty. Everybody left. The anchor left. The mom and pop tenants left. Those are the first ones to go was the mom and pop tenants. So if you got a retail center full of little mom and pop tenants, boy, I'm telling you, you better back, you better, you better have a game plan because boy, if anything fell, anything hit the fan, all of them leaving. Because those are the first people that leave are mom and pop tenants when you got a retail center or if you got an office building. If it's just mom and pop tenants, they leaving. They just gonna leave. I ain't going to pay your rent and they're going to leave. So get your financial house in order. If you got your deposits in these small and medium sized banks, go online, try to do a little research and figure out exactly who these people are, exactly where they're putting your deposits, exactly where they're lending your deposits. How do they make their revenue? If I'm you, I'd go ask them. Hey, ABC Bank, um, how do you guys make your revenue? What do you guys do with my deposits? I mean, it's your money. You, you don't got a right to go ask them that? Guys, let me tell you, credit unions ain't no different. They ain't no different. I know, I know credit unions typically try to uh, zero out and not really make a profit. It's normally a nonprofit. That's a little bit better. But I ain't going to say it's any better. They still got to pay payroll. They still got to uh, pay for uh, upkeep and maintenance to their buildings. So they still got to make enough money to break even. Not, not saying that they're trying to make a profit because most credit unions are non-profit. Not all of them, but most of them are non-profits, right? So their goal is to what? Break even every year. 
but a lot of them do better than break even. They have cash reserves. They still got to make money. They still lend money. You just got to figure out at your credit union, where are they lending the money at? What concentration? Is it residential real estate? Is it commercial real estate? Is it unsecured loans? Is it credit cards? Somewhere they're putting your deposits to make money. You got to find out where. Where are you concentrated at? If there is no concentration, you're Gucci, right? Or if you got $250,000 or more in there, you may want to get a secondary bank for the excess, right? All I'm saying is no, listen guys, never take anything for granted in this financial system we live in. I keep telling y'all the 1% run all of this. They care nothing about you. Y'all don't, some of y'all don't want to listen to that. They don't. I don't know why y'all think, oh, yeah, go see my let's go see my bank every day. And they give me cookies and they ask me if I want coffee and everybody in there knows me by my first name. <sighs> Guys, that's a false sense of security, man. I'm telling you, them people go get back. Listen, they don't ain't, them ain't the people who make the decisions. They're going to be in trouble just like you. They're just employees. I don't care if they give you cookies. I don't care if they give you a fresh cup of coffee every time you walk in. I don't care if they give you dog uh, doggy treats through the drive through window. Oh, these are my friends. They give me doggy treats. Okay. Okay. Keep that approach. I'm telling you, it ain't too late till it's too late. Just know what they're doing with your money is my point, guys. Please know what your bank is doing with your deposits. You have a right to know that. Forget the cookies. Forget the dog treats. Forget the lollipops. Figure out what these people are doing with your deposits. Because they're doing something with them. They're doing something with them. You better figure it out. All right, let's move on. We're going to uh, dive into the jobs report. Because we're going to tie all this thing in at the end, right? Let's jump into the jobs report. And uh, that came out today. How many of y'all have looked at the jobs report that came out for February today? How many of y'all, somebody in the chat, chime in and let me know who's looked at it. Came out at 8.30 this morning, 8.30 Eastern time. Who looked at it? See, I keep telling y'all guys, you need to know this financial information so that you know how to move and strategize to build wealth. Okay, I got one, one, of, my, one of my guys in here. Okay, good, one of my guys. So let, let's dive into the report. This is the 2024 February jobs report that came out today, right? So the market slash economists, they were predicting that the economy would add 198,000 new jobs in February. That's what they were predicting. We added, well, not we, the economy, I guess that does, us in the economy, the economy added 275,000 jobs. So we, we, we missed expectations. Now, is that red hot? Well, let's look at January. So if you go back to January of 2024, labor report, initially the labor report came in at 350,000 new jobs added in January. Red, red hot. Now, it was later revised down to 290,000 jobs. So let, let's just say January came in at 290K. It was revised down from the 350 initial, and then it was revised down to 290. So today's report for February came in at 275. So not as red hot as January. Not bad, because guess what? We need the labor market to soften somewhat to inflict a little bit more financial pain so we can get inflation down to the 2%. So, so not bad. January red hot, February a little softer, little softer, not much softer, but a little softer. But here's the kicker. Here's the kicker, what you got to pay attention to. What did unemployment do? What did unemployment do? Last month, unemployment was what? 3.7%, I believe. In February, what was it? 3.9%. So unemployment goes up now. 
didn't add as many jobs, plus unemployment goes up. Here's where I'm going with that. Remember, back in early February, I did a video or two, and I was telling you guys that what the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and CBO, which is the Congressional Budget Office, these were their predictions for 2024 for unemployment. The Fed's prediction was 4.1%. CBO's prediction was 4.4%. From January, 3.7. February, we jump up to 3.9. What does that tell you? What's happening now? Remember, we've been seeing some of these tech companies and, and, and some of these other companies, big retailers, starting to lay people off. That started in January. Now you get the February's report you can kind of start seeing it take an effect on unemployment rate. Unemployment rates moving up, still manageable, still not out of control, and the Fed don't want it out of control. The Fed don't want it to go to 5%, but the Fed does want it to go up to 4% or slightly higher because what does that do? That puts more pressure on who? You and I to stop spending money on things we don't really need. But see, if we can put more pressure that you may lose your job, you may not have an income, you may not get wages, you will start pulling back on crazy crap that you're buying. That's the only way you're gonna do it. That's the reason why they want the labor market to soften. They don't want it to, to, to freaking turn into uh, marshmallows, be that soft, but they do want it to soften because that will discourage a lot of Consumers over here in the matrix, it will discourage a lot of people in the matrix to stop spending money that they don't need. So we see unemployment starting to creep. Now, I don't know if it'll continue to creep, and I'm just telling you what the Fed prediction was, 4.1% for 2024, and what CBO, Congressional Budget Office, 4.4. We're starting to see that move up. We're starting to see the labor market soften a little bit. We're starting to see unemployment move up, which makes sense. Over the last several weeks, we've been seeing all these videos about people being fired and uh, big tech layoffs. That's what's happening. Let's talk about wages. In February, wages went up by 0.1% month over month. Wages went up by 4.3% year over year. But if you go back to January and you look at January wages year over year, it was 4.5%. So even that's starting to come down slightly. Wages, right? So wages went up 4%, 4.3% year over year, February to February. But what did inflation do? This is what I'm trying to get you guys to understand. What did inflation do? So you're outpacing inflation basically by maybe not, not you know, a few basis points, guys. I think year over year inflation was what, 3.9? Core inflation? Core inflation was 3.9? We haven't got that for February yet, but I think for January, year over year, it was 3.9. 3.7 or 3.9 for January, year over year. So you got January, year over year Wages went up 4.5%, but inflation was dang on near 4%. So your, your wages outpaced inflation year over year by like 50 basis points. Very, very small, narrow, and that's coming down. So we'll get the CPI inflation report for February. I think that's coming out next week. So that report will come out next week, and then you can compare inflation, core inflation, to wage growth year over year. Very, very thin though, guys, very thin. So you got really no room. And that's why I be telling you guys, we, we, we talk about how, why are people still spending? Because they got wages. We know they don't have any personal savings. We done depleted that. You know you don't have access to borrow money anymore. Why? Because interest rates are too high. You don't have access to that. That's a money supply that's been turned off. Your personal savings is turned off because you don't have any more. All you got are your wages, and the Fed knows that. So if they keep softening the job market, not recession softening, but just softening, that's going to continue to compress that spread between your wages and inflation. 
Right now, it's a very thin spread anyways, because if you look at January's numbers, year over year, wages went up 4.5%, but inflation was 3.9%. You got 60 basis points, man. That's thin. So your wages outpaced inflation by 60 basis points. And that's not even really true, because when you look at inflation, you got to compound it. If you compound it, I would say inflation is still higher than your wages. That's the problem people have. It. Remember that a couple weeks ago, I did a, 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 a video about Wells Fargo money survey that they did where people were saying, you know something, we, you know, our wages, all we got enough in our wages is just to pay for our, our, our everyday needs. We don't have any money left to go go take trips or take a day trip or do a, a day spa or blah, 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 blah. We got no money for extras. That's why. You got no savings and they done turned off the money supply from loans because rates are too high. So all you got left is your wages. All I'm telling you is, is you got to be careful, guys. The only way you protect yourself in the environment we're in. See, you got to understand a lot of people, well, the economy is doing great. No, it's doing great for the 1%. You got two economies. You got the economy of the 1%. They're flourishing. They're thriving. All-time highs, selling stock. That's the 1% economy. Down here in this bust economy, see, that's the boom economy. In this bust economy down here are people who are living paycheck to paycheck, and I just told you why. They got no savings. They don't have access to loans. All they got is their, their, their wages, and their wages are barely outpacing inflation. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? This is why I'm saying, guys, you got to pay attention to this information because it'll help you be a better investor. And you got the Federal Reserve chair saying we're going to keep rates higher for longer. So what does that mean? You won't have access to loans for a while, for a while. He's saying we're going to keep these rates higher for long until we're absolutely convinced inflation is not going to turn itself around. We're not going to take our foot off of inflation's neck. Not just yet. So you better come up with a game plan, guys. You're down here in this bust economy. You better come up with a game plan. What's my game plan? If I were you, I'd go get me a secondary income. I'd go get me a third dairy income. I'd go get me a fourth dairy income. I'd get me multiple income streams. I can't rely on this job. People are firing people left and right. I'm, hey, guys, I'm telling you what's happening. Inflation is starting to go up. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to go to 5% or 6 I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you it's going to go up just enough to inflict more financial pain so people can stop spending and the Fed can get inflation to 2%. Bam. That's all they're trying to do. They're going to keep rates higher for longer and they're going to keep doing everything they can to continue to slightly soften the labor market. And that softening could mean hundreds of thousands of jobs lost. It could mean millions of jobs lost. Could mean your job loss. How do you protect yourself? More than one stream of income. That's how you protect yourself. You got to have more than one stream of income. You got to. Oh, shoot. I, 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 uh -uh. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to lower myself to those standards. Okay. See, I already told y'all guys, the three killers, the three killers of financial freedom, three killers, fear, pride, greed. And guess what? You, when you're doing this, oh, I'm too good for that. That's pride. That's a financial killer. That's a financial freedom killer. Pride. You better go out and figure out some multiple streams of income. I'm telling you, I don't care what income level you're in. Unless you're already at your freedom, you better go figure out something. And what's freedom? Assets. Freedom is assets that produce income. That's freedom. If you don't got that, I don't care how much money you make. If you don't have assets that actually generate money passively, that ain't freedom. You just got a job. You just got a good job with good wages. But guess what? Somebody else controls your financial destiny. And if they decide one day, they want to take that from you. Guess what they can do? They can take it. They can't take my assets. They can't take my assets. Nobody can take my assets. But they can't take my job. Whenever they want. So don't sit around. Well, I'm a top producer. They'll never let me go. I'm a 
top, you the first one gonna go. You top producers, you'll be the first ones to go. I'm just telling you guys, I done been in the, I done been in corporate America for 25 years. I've been in corporate America for 25 years. I was in corporate America for 25 years. I've seen it, guys. See, when I'm talking about this banking stuff that I just talked about in, in, in section one with the Fed, guys, I know what I'm talking about. I worked for big boy banks and I worked for small and medium sized banks. And those small and medium sized banks I worked for, we made all of our money off loans. Taking your deposits and lending them out to people to buy commercial real estate loan or multifamily, that type of stuff. That's how we made all of our money. We didn't have no 85 lines of business. We didn't have an international trading desk. We didn't have a Forex desk. We didn't have a derivatives desk. We didn't have a wealth management group that's managing trillions of dollars in wealth. We didn't have that. We had loans. We had your deposits and loans. That's it. Right? Our assets were our loans. Our liabilities were your deposits. Your deposits were liabilities for us because we didn't own them. We had to pay you interest on them. That's a liability. It takes money out of our pocket to have your, de your, your deposits. It takes money out of a bank's pocket to have your deposits. It's a liability. Deposits are a liability for banks. The loans that they go make with your deposits, guess what they are? They're assets. Why are they assets? Because they put money in the bank's pocket. I keep telling y'all, assets put money in your pocket, liabilities take money out of your pocket. Assets put money in your pocket, liabilities take money out of your pocket. Banks know that. Your deposits are liabilities because they got to pay you interest. Their loans that they make with your money are assets because they put money in their pocket. The problem is when they make bad loans and those loans don't produce no money, guess what happens? They paying you interest. They not collecting no money. You ain't got to be a rocket scientist. I'm not getting money, but I'm giving out money. That can't last. They shut down. That's when the FDIC has to step in and take them over. So all I'm saying is you got to pay attention. This jobs report would have given you a lot of information. That's why I try to do these videos to give you guys my little two cents. I'm no expert. I'm just giving you my little two cents. That's it. I'm no expert. I just pay attention and, and give you the information as I see it based on my experience. Now, we're going to move on from jobs and we got to quickly get out of here because we got a couple things we want to hit and then we're going to get out of here. Jobs that were added in February. Healthcare, 67,000 jobs added in February in healthcare. I told you guys, we got an aging population in this country. Healthcare, I'm telling you, if you don't have healthcare ETF on your short list, think about it. We got an aging population, they're hiring people. 67,000 of them were hired in February. Here we go. Government, you know they're always hiring people, right? They added 52,000 jobs. Government. And then this one surprised me. Coming in third at 42,000 were restaurants and bars. <laughs> we ain't gonna never stop spending, are we? We gonna spend all the way. We gonna go down with the Titanic spending, boy. Hey, the Titanic sinking. I ain't, I ain't, I'm gonna stay on the Titanic. I'm gonna go right down with it. I'm gonna keep spending. We just won't. How in the world are you adding 42,000 jobs to bar and restaurants when we need to be stop spending and put money in there to get, build wealth? Boy, we're a trip here to the United States. I, but that shows you the power of the matrix. That's the matrix. How in the world do you add 42,000? That shows you the power of the matrix. People still got their head buried in the sand like ain't nothing happening. They out drinking and, and boozing and, and, and eating good food and, and all that old stuff. Matrix, matrix. Should be over here building wealth. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to stocks. And then we're going we gonna to have our daily dose of crypto and we're going to get out of here. Let, 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 let's move on to stocks. So yesterday, when the Fed chair met with the Senate, the Senate Banking Committee, how did the stock market do? How did the stock market take that meeting? Now, we know on Wednesday when he met with the House of Representatives, that committee, that, that financial services committee in the House of Representatives, the market did okay. 
Matter of fact, it bounced a little bit. It, it was okay. No, no major news came out of that meeting. The Fed chair said exactly what he needed to say. And all the market is concerned with, guys, listen to me carefully. The only thing the stock market is concerned with is that the Fed chair continues to say they're going to reduce interest rates in 2024. They don't care when. Please understand that. The market doesn't care when he reduces them. As long as he keeps saying he's going to reduce them, that will continue to fuel the stock market. What is that? That optimism. See, that, that, that optimistic outlook is fueling the economy. It's a, not the economy, but the stock market. So as long as the Fed chair don't go somewhere and say something like, no, we ain't reducing short-term interest rates in 2024. If he say that, you're going to see the stock market sell off. You are. It's going to sell off. Long as he don't say that, I don't care if you have a million meetings. Long as he doesn't say we're not reducing short-term interest rates in 2024, you're going to see the stock market be okay. That's why I'm telling you guys, keep buying, keep buying, keep buying, keep buying. And if he does say that and it dips, guess what? Guys, what do we love? We love red days, right? We love red days. But that doesn't mean we, we, we derail our wealth transfer blueprint, which is every single month we're in the market 365 days a year. But I'm just telling you what to listen for. If you're saying, what could derail the stock market right now? Those few little words will derail it for a little bit. If he says, we've made the decision, we're not going to reduce short-term interest rates in 2024, that's all you need. We're going to have a sell-off. Long as he doesn't say that, we're Gucci. So, Wednesday's meeting, he didn't say we were going to, he, he said we're going to reduce. And then guess what? In, in Thursday's meeting, he said the same thing. We, we are expected we are expected to cut rates. Rate cuts are a possibility. So he, even when he said it, however you want to say it, long as he say rate cuts are coming, the market don't care when. So they don't care if it comes in March. They don't care if it comes in May meeting. They don't care if it comes in June. They just need it to come. They need that optimism. They need that forward guidance. They need that clarity. The market will continue going, right? So what did the S&P 500 do yesterday? After the during the Fed's comments at, at the Senate Banking Committee. Matter of fact, the S&P 500 rose by 1%, guys, to a new record high. Right? To a new record high. That's what I'm telling you guys. You got to be in the market every day. You don't know when that day the rocket ship takes. You just got to be on the rocket ship. You got to be on the rocket ship every day. I don't know when the rocket ship going to take off. I got to be on it every day. I got to be in the market every day because I never know when it's going to take off, right? So S&P, good day. Very good day. Here we go. NASDAQ, even a better day. 1.5% increase in the NASDAQ yesterday. Why? Tech and growth stocks killing it. Oh, what do you mean, Richard? You mean to tell me your three big boy blue chip wealth transfer assets are killing it? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, why? I got an S&P 500 ETF, SPLG. 1% gain yesterday. I'll take it. Oh, what about my information technology ETF that I have? FTEC. Good day. NASDAQ had a 1.5% gain yesterday. Good day. Oh, what about the Magnificent Seven? Collectively, good day. Apple still trading at a discount. Tesla still trading at a discount. But guys, that's an opportunity. I keep telling y'all, Apple is the most valuable company in the world. It's trading at a discount. For whatever reason, I don't know. I, I ain't that smart. I don't know. I just know it's Apple. I heard somebody say, well, you know, these products are kind of, they're innovation. Bull crap. Hogwash. That's hogwash. They'll be fine. I'm going to keep buying them at a discount. I'm going to keep buying Tesla at a discount. I want Tesla to get down to $150 a share. That's where I want Tesla at. If I can get Tesla under $150 a share, guys, I'm all in. I'm going to take a big part of my reserves and dump it in Tesla. 
if I can get them down to 150 a share. And I'm okay with staying there for three, four, five years. I don't care because I know at some point they're coming. See, Elon Musk is a genius, man. This boy, this guy ain't no fool. And I know some of y'all, because I've got the emails and the DMs, what did, what's, what's Elon doing talking about the politics and blah, 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 all this other. The guy's a genius, man. The guy know what he's doing. Trust me. He positioned in something, and I'm going to be right there with him when it pop. He positioned in something, guys. I'm telling you, this guy is a genius, man. He's positioning something. He is positioning himself. And I'm going to be right there, right there with him. Just let him get under $150 a share. I'm all in. Now, I'm buying monthly. I ain't timing the market because I'm in there monthly. Magnificent 7, S&P 500. I'm in there. But this little reserve, this special money, ooh, boy, if he get to 150, I'm all in. And I'm going to go on that journey with him. So I don't know about y'all, but yesterday was amazing. These last two days in the market were amazing for me. I made a lot of money. I kept doubling down. I'm buying every day now. Two of my three big boys, uh, uh, SPLG and FTEX. And you know why I'm buying everyday guys? SPLG is 50, what, $60 a share? Something like that. Come on, man. I think in 10 years it'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll 5X itself. That's what I think. Now, you don't have to believe that. You, you can believe whatever you want to believe. I'm telling you what I believe. I believe it's going to 5X itself in the next 10 years. So every dollar I can put in at $60 a share, I'm going to 5X it. I'm a five exit. Maybe I ain't going to say that. I ain't going to say 10 exit, but five exit. Can I get to $300 a share in 10 years? Go from 60 to 300. <sighs> Guys, do you know if this thing goes from 60 to $300 a share over the next 10 years? What my net worth is going to do? Because I'm going to be buying this thing like crazy. FTEX, 150 something dollars a share. Big boy, big boy tech ETF. It's Okay, I'm just telling you guys, if you want to build wealth, this is how I'm doing it. You want, to, you want to copy my plan, please do. If you don't want to copy my plan, don't. Come up with your own plan. But what I found is most people don't have no plan. They don't have a plan. Don't have a plan. Buy whatever you want to buy, guys. I don't care what you buy. I don't care. Buy something. Buy something that has a historical track record of making money. That's the key. Historical track record of making money. And it's a big boy. It's a big boy. That's all I'm telling you. Now, Fed optimistic inflation goes down to 2%. Rate cuts possible this year. That's what's fueling stocks. That one sentence. Fed optimistic inflation going down to 2%. Rate cuts possible this year. Bingo. That's what's fueling this thing, guys. That's what's the, the fuel that's going into the rocket ship. That sentence, as long as we keep hearing that, we're good to go. Keep buying. Keep doubling down. Be in the rocket. Be on the rocket ship in your seat. Seat belt fastened every day because we don't know when it's going to take off. We need to be on the rocket ship. That's all I'm telling you about stocks. Good last two days. I'm buying my butt off. Dollar cost averaging in every month, and I'm spot buying every day, every other day, every five, lose $500 or $1,000. I get, I'm, I'm spot just buying. If I get a lose $500 from something, boom, I'm throwing it in. That's all I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna do that every day. I don't care if it's two, three hundred dollars a day, hundred dollars a day, but I'm putting it in. Putting it in. Because I know in 10 years, my plan is the 5X every dollar that I put in through this wealth transfer blueprint over the next 10 years. I want a five exit. Because I already told y'all, I, 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 I got to get this piece of property in the Caribbean. My own, my own piece of land right on the beach. Right on the Caribbean ocean. Build me a little house on it. Uh -uh. And it's going to be in an unpopulated part of the Caribbean where we ain't got a lot of tourists. Just locals. Really no cars. Right? That's what that's my retirement. That's my golden years. In order to fund that, I gotta double my net worth. I need to fund that and then live out the rest of my days and then guess what I'm gonna do with, with, with what's what's left? Pass it on to my children. That's the legacy for me, guys. I'm a simple guy. I'm a simple guy. 
I just want to have a good lifestyle that I'm happy in, help people, get paid, pass on to my children. That's it. I'm a simple guy. That's what fuels me. Question is, what fuels you? What, what, what are you running hard after? What's on your bucket list? See, you notice, I didn't say anything about a Ferrari. I didn't say anything about a Lambo. I didn't say anything about, oh, I didn't want to ride on a private jet. I didn't say anything like that. What I said was, I want my own little piece of land in the Caribbean Ocean on that crystal blue water, beautiful sky, nice little place. Not a mansion, just a nice little place, couple bedrooms, so if my kids want to come visit, they got somewhere to sleep. Simple life, right? Full of happiness and just doing what I want to do, but I don't get there unless I give up something today. I got to give up something today to get everything I want tomorrow. What are you willing to give up today? What are you going to give up? Find something that's important to you that ain't got nothing to do with things in your life. What's important to you? And what you're doing today, is it going to get you there? I don't know. Is it? Is it going to get you there? What you're doing today, is it going to get you there? You got to ask yourself that. Last thing we're going to cover, and I need to go to the $1 trillion research lab for this one. So I got to turn on the phone. Hopefully it don't mess up my, my little live stream here. But I got to go to the $1 trillion research lab in order for this last piece of information on crypto. And they're going to wrap this thing up and we're going to get out of here and enjoy the rest of our weekend. Right now, of course, I'll be back tomorrow and in Sunday in some shape, form or fashion. Uh, because you guys know I do this every day. This is this is this is a part of the blueprint. Part of the blueprint is not just about money. It's about helping people, right? Because I get my pleasure and my self-worth from my creator, God, Jesus Christ, my family, and then the amount of people that I help. In that order. God, Jesus Christ, family, and how many people can I help to get to freedom? That's my life. That's my self-worth. That's what I want to be remembered for when I leave this place. You better figure out what you want to be remembered for. That's my recommendation. Figure out what you want to be remembered for, man. What is your legacy going to be? Okay, let's move on to a daily dose of crypto. What's happening in the world of crypto? Let's, let's, let's take a look. As banks buy up Bitcoin, <laughs> who else are the Bitcoin whales? That's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about that. Now, it's no secret, guys, that Wall Street is buying up crypto. Now, here's the thing, though. Wall Street been bought crypto. So that's why I disagree with this article from the BBC. Wall Street been buying up crypto. Wall, Wall Street started buying crypto back in 2022. I told y'all that's when, when the 1% started buying heavily again crypto after the last pump and dump. So the pump, the last pump was 2021. The last dump was 2022. So they pumped it on you in 21, sold out. They sold it all to you guys, all the 99% got stuck with the pump price. And then when it dumped and we started selling, the, the, the 99 cents started selling, guess who swooped back in? The 1% swooped back in and start buying it all up again in 2022. The price of Bitcoin is close to all-time high thanks to large part to U.S. finance giants, <laughs> a.k.a. 1%. Investment firms like Grayscale, BlackRock, Fidelity are pouring billions of dollars into buying the volatile digital asset. And it is volatile, a.k.a. pump and dump, right? Volatile just means it's a pump and dump. That, that, that's basically what volatile means, right? It's a pump and dump. In the last few weeks, these powerful institutions have become so-called Bitcoin wells, See, y'all thought I was just throwing that term around just because I'm, 
I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a brilliant guy and I, I can come up with brilliant terms. No, I got it from these guys. I got it from the article. I, I read all this stuff and I get all my stuff from these articles. I'm not that brilliant. I just read and I just it, it, write it down and then I did regurgitate it to you guys. So you know my secret. I, I, I just go to the $1 trillion um, research lab. Now, I know some of y'all asking me, Richard, what is the $1 trillion research lab? It's Google. <laughs> Just Google. That's my $1 trillion research lab. See? That $1 trillion research lab. Very reliable, too. Very reliable. I, I, go check it out. It's very reliable. So here, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Because of Bitcoin's system, there will only be 21 million Bitcoins. I, I disagree with you, BBC. Mm -mm -mm. 1% for the credit, some more. <laughs> Definitely cut it in half. Now you're going to have 42 million Bitcoin. And I told y'all yesterday, these people ain't stupid, right? So they see an opportunity to pump and dump you guys. And they say, well, you know, we can pump and dump these folks for the next 20 years. Let's just pump and dump them for the next 20 years, but let's, let's make more coins. Let's be more pump and dump. Let's make more. Now, even though it was mandated on the original white paper, that there only could be 21 million, we're gonna create more. All right, let's create some more. And again, if you don't agree with me, guys, that's fine. Go, go start your YouTube channel, and maybe you'll get some subscribers, and maybe you'll get somebody to come look at your videos. And guess what? You get to tell your side of the story. But on this video, on this channel, I only side I'm gonna tell is mine. You wanna tell your side of the story, create your YouTube channel, go get you a little, a few viewers. Get you somebody that'll tune into your live stream, and then you can tell your side of the story. No one cares what your side of the story is in the comments right here. No one cares. Just an FYI. 19 million have been created, but many are already accounted for and probably off the market. So 21 million initially created, 19 million, they're saying, are off the market. Or, or someone owns. So what other organizations or individuals are Bitcoin wells? And what does the shift in wealth mean for the digital currency that was originally created as a peer-to-peer -peer internet money? Let's concentrate on that for a second. Has it really been that? I'm sure I'm gonna have my, 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 my crypto advocates in the, in the chat here is it really a peer-to-peer -peer internet money? Now, in order to be money, a medium of exchange, I gotta be able to purchase stuff with it. I'm not talking about Ferraris or Lambos. I'm talking about eggs, milk, flour, vegetables, car wash, dry cleaning, get my house clean, I got to be able to purchase stuff. But are we able to do that? A peer-to-peer. -peer, you guys know what peer-to-peer -peer means, right? You and me. <laughs> Just you and me. I should be. You should be able to say, you know something, Richard? I want a coaching session. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and send it right over to you. Now, some of y'all might be able to do that because you may already have a little wallet set up and your little crypto in there. I don't have any. I don't have no wallet. I don't have crypto and I ain't planning on opening one. So you, you, you could peer to peer me because I'm not opening one. <laughs> so I don't know how it's going to be some take over the dollar. It won't. I ain't but a small number of you guys even know what this is. Most people just get in because it's a pump and dump and they think they can get rich quick. Peer to peer internet money. I don't know what. Oh, come on, man. That's just a joke. A joke. Let's move on. That's a joke. Bitcoin lost forever. There's, this article is saying 2.4 million Bitcoin are lost forever. People done forgot their wallet numbers. They got one guy who lost 8,000 Bitcoin on a discarded hard drive. 8,000 Bitcoins, lost it. Because, see, Come on, guys. You're really trying to think I'm going to put my life savings on some on the Internet, on some drive that, that, that no regulation, can nobody find it. 
There ain't no FDIC insurance. There is no uh, brokerage, uh, and I can't remember the acronym for the brokerage, uh, but it's 500000 per client. So if you got your money on these brokerage uh, firms, you get up to 500000 but it's not insured on the FDIC, but it's another one, and I can't remember the name of it. Somebody in the chat will probably find it for me. So you got the brokerage side where you got up to $500,000 insured, and then on the, and then on the, 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 the regular deposit side, it's FDIC insurance. So that's it, SP, SIPC, right? That's the insurance on the brokerage side, up to $500,000. But traditional assets, not no Bitcoin. Traditional assets, and then you got paper uh, dollars over here, deposits with FDIC. Now you got SIPC, and then you got FDIC. Guess what you don't have? You got nothing for Bitcoin. So that 8,000 Bitcoin, gone forever that this guy just lost. So you got 2.4 million vanished, thin air, just, just gone, just gone. Here you go. You got 2.3 million Bitcoin controlled by who? Crypto exchanges. Y'all remember crypto exchanges, right? These are the guys who ripped off millions of people out of billions of dollars. Cryptocurrency exchanges act like banks for crypto users. You can exchange your traditional money like dollars or pounds for Bitcoin and other digital tokens. Binance is the world's largest exchange and is estimated to have about 550,000 Bitcoin. Here's the problem. Binance just got fined $4 billion. Yeah. $4 billion. Why were they fined $4 billion? Can anybody remember that from yesterday's video? Why Binance was fined $4 billion? Now, these guys have over 550,000 Bitcoin on their exchange. Can somebody tell me why they were fined $4 billion? Uh, yeah, that little thing they call money laundering. Yeah, they had some allegations tied to them, some little money laundering. Yeah, that'll do it. A little bit of money laundering. That's probably not where I would want my crypto or my Bitcoin held at. If I got to pay the U.S. government $4 billion. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, I digress. Let's move on. Let's move on. Y'all already know how I feel about crypto exchanges and crypto lenders. They're just cro they're crooks, right? They're just, they're stealing money from you. They're taking your Bitcoin and lending it out and doing what? I keep telling y'all, anytime y'all put y'all money somewhere, people are taking that money and making money off of it. Problem is most of these people don't know what they're doing. They're just smart guys or smart gals, intellectually with number smarts, good with math, but they know nothing about the business world. Nothing. Now, they may have a PhD from, from some Ivy League school, but they don't know nothing about the business world. They don't know how to really make money. And that's why y'all put your money with all these people who, who like average age is 25. Now, they're geniuses, but they're 25, 30 years old, don't know nothing about real business, don't know nothing about real making money. And y'all put your money on their little thing that they set up, these little crypto exchanges, these little crypto lending. And why do you do it? You're greedy. You're trying to get a 15, 20% return on your little money. You got, you got to know, guys, if anybody's offering you that, you got to know it's, it's shady. There's a price to pay for 15, 20% return. You do know that, right? It's a price to pay. And that price, a lot of people pay with these crypto exchanges and these crypto lenders. Voyager, FTX, Celsius, Binance. Now, Binance is still in existence. They're still operating, but they had to pay $4 billion. Anybody can absorb a $4 billion. I got to be scared of them, right? I got to be scared. So let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's finish our daily dose. You got 1.6 million Bitcoin that belong to unknown wells. Just unknown people. Nobody ain't ever heard of. Unknown whales. <laughs> a Bitcoin whale is someone who holds more than 10,000 Bitcoin in their digital wallet. The website BitInfoCharts 
uses public blockchain records to keep a blockchain rich list of 100 richest wallets. And there are about 80 wallets with 10,000 coins or more whose owners are unknown. Come on, guys. Unknown. <laughs> Could be anybody. Could be anybody. It could be anybody. It could be Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. You know the Mickey Mouse I'm talking about, right? Disney World Mickey Mouse. He probably got 10,000 Bitcoin. I don't know. I, 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 they are no. Could be Mickey Mouse. Crazy, man. Bitcoin crazy. Crypto crazy. Yet to be mined. Yet to be mined. 1.4 million Bitcoin are yet to be mined. The way that Bitcoin was invented means there can only be ever 21 million coins. Well, that's a lie because they're going to create some more. They're going to have it. I know what a lot of y'all are saying. Well, just because they have it, it doesn't mean it's more than 21. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. They're going to figure out a way. They're going to figure out a way to pump and dump y'all again and again and again and again and again on something that was created to be a peer-to-peer -peer internet money, which never happened over the 15 years. It has never been be, became a mainstream peer-to-peer -peer internet money. Never, never in 15 years. It's never, never fully developed the blockchain. Never in 15 years. What it has done in 15 years is stolen billions of dollars from the 99 percent that it has done that Let, let's get it so that's one accomplishment for it it's stolen billions of dollars from the 99 percent over time the amount of coins given out as part of the mining reward is automatically reduced and in april it will be it, it will have again have have that's what they call it but it's just creating more of it that's all in my opinion that's all it's doing they just create more Create more supply. Because the white sheet, when it originally came out, never mentioned that. It never mentioned nothing about that. So we just creating this now. You do understand the 1% done got a hold of it, and they're going to create whatever they want to create. You do know that, right? Oh, oh, here's a, here's a great one right here. Check this one out, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. Check this one out. Bitcoin inventor. Do you guys know how many Bitcoin this guy uh, Shitoshi Nokomoto, whatever his name is, that ain't his real name, but whatever little name he's using, that created this thing in 2009. This guy got 1.1 million Bitcoin. <laughs> Help me out with this. Created it from thin air. Created it from thin air. <laughs> he created it from thin air. Go ahead and unsubscribe. Who cares? No one cares. Hey, man. Peace. Good luck to you. Go build your wealth. Appreciate you stopping in. No one cares if you unsubscribe. Go ahead. Thumbs up to you. I wish you well in your endeavors. So Satoshi Nakamoto, Bitcoin inventor, 1.1 million Bitcoin. My goodness. Guys, do you know what that's worth today? At today's numbers? That's like $76 billion. This guy is worth $76 billion dollars thin air this guy goes from creating a white paper in 2009 a white paper and 15 years later he's never showed his face he's never did an interview and guess what he's worth 76 billion dollars y'all don't see anything wrong with that I mean, am I the only one that sees us just a little, little problem with that? <laughs> that is amazing. The guy owns 1.1. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. The anonymous creator of Bitcoin holds estimated 1.1 million Bitcoin in wallets that were the first to be created in 2009. None of the coins have been moved in years. And no one knows who Satoshi is or even if he, she, they are still alive. If they are still alive and estimates are correct, 
then this would make Satoshi Nakamoto roughly the 22nd richest person in the world. This stash is about 5% of all Bitcoin. <laughs> Ooh, Lord Jesus. This man, woo, or Gara, or whoever it is, man, kudos to you. Kudos to you. You go from zero to 76 billion in 15 years. Never showed your face. Never did an interview. Nobody know who you are. <laughs> Boy, this crypto thing, a monster. It's a monster. It's a monster. It is a monster. In January, U.S. financial authorities allow regulated investment firms to start selling new financial products linked to Bitcoin called spot Bitcoin ETFs. In mid-February, the investment giants that applied to start ETFs began buying Bitcoin in the thousands. Now, y'all already know they already had that Bitcoin, right? Yeah, they already had that Bitcoin. Y'all know uh, uh, BlackRock already had that Bitcoin. Y'all know Grayscale already had that Bitcoin from the last dump. They've been buying that Bitcoin since the last dump, man. And anticipation of this ETF being approved. That's all that was. Oh, they only just started buying it a month ago. That's crap. See, this is how the 1% try to, to, try, to, try, to, try to just manipulate us. You really want me to think Grayscale... BlackRock, when it was $17 a coin, wasn't buying and stockpiling it. Come on, guys. Y'all know better than that. Y'all know better than that. Y'all know better than that. So let's move on here. Begin buying Bitcoins in the thousands. Have everything from hedge funds to stock market traders purchased ETFs to bet on the price of Bitcoin without having to own any coins themselves. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. There is 933,000 coins that have been allocated or purchased by February 29 and are currently being held by the institutions for these new financial products. The biggest holder is Grayscale, which started as a digital currency investment firm. So you mean to tell me Grayscale, they are a digital current currency investment firm. They just started buying Bitcoin in February. Y'all 1% something else, man. Y'all 1% is something else. It is estimated to have over 450,000 Bitcoin. Oh, they just started buying them in February, though. Okay. Yeah. All right. Other giants include BlackRock, 150,000. And Fidelity, 102,000. Notice anything, man. These are all 1%ers. You don't hear them say nothing about the 99% owning anything like that. All 1%ers, right? Law enforcement, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. Police forces around the world regularly bust cybercrime gangs or illicit marketplaces seizing huge stashes of Bitcoins in the process. There have been ma three major seizures of Bitcoin in the U.S. since 2020. Eventually, they will be sold at auction. So they take them from the criminals and then they go right back and reduce them right back to the pump and dump. All right. Let's go take them from these criminals, these so-called criminals, and then we're going to reintroduce them back to the pump and dump. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Eventually, they will be sold at auction. Yeah. So there you go, guys. That's my daily dose. That's my daily dose of crypto. Daily dose. Again, ain't nothing changed. I still think it's a, a Ponzi scheme. I, th I still think it's a scam. So none of that's changed. I still feel the same way. Um, I think for me, at least, it's not a place I would put my money. I, I, I never would. Not at that scale, especially not in today's prices at almost record highs, because, of course, this is the pump phase. Uh, could it go to 75K a coin? Could it go to 80K a coin? Could it even hit 100K a coin? It could. It just depends on how how big the pump is. It could. It could go up to $100,000 a coin. And there will be people out there that buy it at that price. So all I can tell you guys is be careful with your money. Build your wealth the right way. Um, pay attention to what the information is out here in this financial world that's being communicated. Keep your eyes open, your ears open, 
and, and take in information, dissect it, throw out what you don't need, and then get yourself on a wealth transfer blueprint to build wealth. If you believe crypto should be a part of that, buy it. It's okay with me. I got no problem with that. I'm just giving you guys my opinion and how I feel about it. That doesn't mean you got to feel that way about it. And if you want to, and if you want to, you know, go to the corner of the room crying and say, you go to, you go unsubscribe to my channel. That's okay too. If you want to be a little baby and go cry, oh, he hurt my feelings. He talking about crypto. He talking about crypto. I'm tired of this guy talking about crypto. I'm, I'm take my blanket and I'm going home. I'm take my toy trains and I'm going home. Bye. Go home. Unsubscribe. Only people I want subscribe and rocking with me are the people that want to build wealth and understand that I'm here to help. I don't care about your little feelings about Bitcoin. Who cares? No one. Like I said, start your YouTube channel and title it Bitcoin. Lover of Bitcoin. Just title that your channel. And you'll get a lot of other lovers that'll subscribe and y'all can glorify and talk up Bitcoin. That's okay. I'm just giving my opinion. Don't get upset and, and sad and mad and unsubscribe because I'm telling you how I feel on my channel. All right, guys, appreciate you rocking with me. If you don't mind, lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. I really, really appreciate you. I appreciate you for hanging in there with me. I know I went a little long, but I had a lot to get in today. Y'all know tomorrow we'll be back again. I may be a little later tomorrow, maybe around 11 o'clock Eastern time because I got some stuff I got to do in the morning. And there may be a chance that I may not show up at all. It just depends on how my day goes. But my goal is to be on here every morning talking to you guys and giving you what I believe are relevant information about building wealth that can help you get to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So if you appreciate that, lock it in with a thumbs up because you know I appreciate y'all. If you want up to 15 free stocks from Moomoo, Moo, guys, Moomoo Moo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks when you open up a new Moomoo Moo brokerage account. You put $100 in that brokerage account, they're going to give you five free stocks. You put $1,000 in that brokerage account, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. There's a link down in the description box of this video. Go click on that Moomoo Moo link. Open up your new Moomoo Moo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. Like I said, guys, if you're stopping by the channel for the first time, and if you want to, go ahead and subscribe. Click that notification bell so that you're notified every time I put up content. My content is here to help you guys build wealth, point blank. So if you're rocking with that, lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. Hit that like button for me. I really, really, truly would appreciate it. That helps the channel. It helps the algorithm get this content out to more people so we can help more people get to their financial freedom. Thoughts become things. You can see it in your mind. You can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy. Get wealthy. And I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.